is the KUSI News at 6. Terrifying moments on a busy San Diego freeway this morning. A small plane crashed right into a car full of people. At least one person is dead as investigators try to figure out what went wrong. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us. I'm Brandi Williams. And I'm David Davis. We begin with special coverage of this deadly plane crash this evening. Over the next few minutes, we have an in-depth look at exactly what happened and conversation as to why it may have happened. We'll talk with a witness who saw the horrifying scene unfold right in front of his eyes. We'll have a live report from the scene from KUSI's John Soderman, where investigators remain this evening in Fallbrook. And check on what the traffic situation is like now, nearly nine hours after it happened. We will also talk to a former FAA investigator on what officials on the scene have been doing all day and what comes next. First, Brandy takes a look at where the crash happened and talks with a witness who watched it unfold. Brandy. So let's take a look at where it happened. You see the plane right here, and this is where the accident went down north on the 15, just right over the 76. In the Fallbrook area, KUSI got a lot of eyewitness pictures and video from people who saw the plane make its emergency landing at the scene. One witness who was at the crash site filmed the heart pounding moments and posted cell phone video to YouTube. I spoke with that witness. His name is John Marshall, who was an LA County resident, and he said the plane crashed just a few feet from his car car on the freeway. I looked up and I saw a plane coming from the east. Um, it basically got over the top of me and then made a right turn, um, lined up with the freeway, the northbound lanes, and um, I'm looking at it thinking, well, he's pretty low. And then all of a sudden, within a few seconds after I saw the plane, he put it down um, on the freeway. Wow. At what point did you decide to grab your cell phone and, and start recording what you were witnessing? Because we have the video that we're seeing right now, and it's pretty incredible. Well, what happened was I was one of the, the first people on scene. Um, we ran up to the plane. We looked at, um, we started assessing some of the people. And in, in my impression, uh, my impression along with the other people there, that it looked like the pilot was in pretty bad condition. So we tried, we proceeded to get the door open, and we couldn't. Um, uh, um, I was, uh, was not wearing shoes at the time. Um, I was wearing flip-flops. And so um, I was stepping in a full a puddle of, of, of fuel from the plane. Mm. So I felt at that point I needed to step back and let the two other guys that were with me um, continue to try to open the door. Uh, and that's when I started to videotape. Now, watching the footage from your cell phone, it seems like you caught it up until they opened the pilot's door. Can you tell us what happened after that? Um, well, I, I, again, I stepped back. I didn't want to be in the way, um, and so I wanted to be, you know, as helpful as I possibly could. So I, I backed off, um, made sure that the two guys that were pulling the, the pilot and uh, his passenger out, uh, they got them out safely. Uh, they laid both of them on the ground. Um, at that point, the pilot was not saying anything. He, was, he, was, he was, had a lot of facial um, uh, damage. Um, and the passenger seemed to be okay, and she was sitting up and talking to another person. Wow. In the video that yeah. you sent us, you also gave us a look at the car where one person has been confirmed dead. What was that scene like? How were the other passengers? You know, um, the other passengers were able to get out of the car on their own, um, and the person that was sitting in the far back uh, left of the car, um, she was obviously trapped, but she was talking. Um, you know, it seemed to be things were okay, uh, and it, it didn't seem to be a big concern, but we were unable to get her out of the car because her door was jammed mm. from the impact of the plane. Now, John Marshall went on to say that traffic was heavy as he continued north to L.A. We will have an update on current traffic conditions resulting from the crash later on in the newscast. So let's take you to the crash site now for that part of our coverage. KUSI's John Soderman is in Fallbrook. John? Yeah, on the note of traffic, uh, both north and southbound just started to finally break free. It took us about 20 minutes to go the final a mile and a half of traffic is moving along much more smoothly because the wreckage now has been completely removed. But let's show you what things look like uh, a couple of hours ago. You're going to see a sedan and you're going to see that plane uh, that crashed into the back of that uh, sedan. Witnesses say the plane uh, skidded for about 250 feet in the slow lane of northbound Interstate 15 before plowing directly into the back of that uh, car that was parked. Uh, the woman who's killed has been identified as 38-year-old Antoinette Francis Isbell of San Diego. 
The pilot identified as Dennis Hoagie, 62 of Amul. He is dealing with life-threatening injuries, very serious head trauma. His passenger suffered a severe neck laceration, but her injuries are not described as life-threatening. Here now more from the CHP. We got the call about 9.17 a.m. Uh, this morning. Uh, we got a call of a plane down northbound 15, uh, just north of the 76, and uh, a plane that had collided with a vehicle that was stopped on the right shoulder. Uh, what we discovered was from witnesses that were on the scene, uh, they related that they observed the plane appearing to have issues uh, in the air, uh, come down, land in the number four lane, and the Nissan was stopped on the right shoulder. Um, according to statements that we received from the driver of that Nissan that he had pulled over to the right shoulder to sync his Bluetooth on his phone and the plane uh, collided with the rear of the Nissan that was stopped on the right shoulder, subsequently killing the right rear passenger. And the woman who was killed, uh, Antoinette uh, Isbell, was in the right rear uh, passenger, or the right rear se uh, seat of that car. She was crushed by the impact from that plane. But once again, traffic is finally starting to free up. NTSB and FAA uh, are on scene here, and we'll hear what they have to say coming up tonight at 10 and 11. Just north of Escondido, John Soderman, KU Sun News. Thank you, John. And as John just mentioned, we just got word that the victim in the crash has been identified. Her name, Antoinette Isabel, 38 years old. She was sitting in the right rear seat of the black Nissan right before the plane hit. According to social media, she lived in San Diego and was a member of the San Diego Roller Derby. There is also a weird connection with this crash and a crash on the same freeway 16 years ago. The FAA is confirming this is not the first incident with this particular plane that was involved. Now, the Lance Air 4P fixed wing single engine may have been built in 2000, by, possibly by Matthew Noakes, a former all-star Major League Baseball catcher who lives in San Diego. In February 2000, Noakes was flying the plane and told investigators the engine died in Med air in its second flight due to problems with the oil filter. Coincidentally, he made an emergency landing on the same stretch of freeway all those years ago. Noakes did not return calls today asking for comment. As you can imagine, the plane crash brought traffic to a standstill for hours. Besides, Dave Scott is tracking our live traffic maps right now. Dave, we just saw John out there. Looks like traffic is finally moving. Yes, yeah, finally beginning to move a little bit because they've spent all day trying to reroute traffic around that. Uh, a lot of people have been stopped on the freeway, the I-15 North, uh, all day, since uh, this happened at, in the 9 o'clock hour. So a lot of people affected by this all day long. This was sent in by Andy Duckleth, I-15 North, Neil Fallbrook. It was just stop. You couldn't really get anywhere. And this was into the afternoon, so you can imagine what it was like earlier this morning. I want to show you where this is on the map, our traffic map, because a little slowdown is, uh, is still occurring here. Uh, even though John Soderman said a little bit of clearing, uh, it's just starting to pick up some of the traffic, but we have been delayed for several hours in this area, right around the 76 and 15. Some folks just deciding to go off here into Pal uh, the Pala area and out towards uh, some of those casinos, but uh, most of the traffic trying to get through up into Temecula. So this has been a difficult situation, so difficult. Take a listen, take a look at some of the uh, footage uh, from the people who have been driving up there, the I-15, because we have uh, some imagery here to share with you uh, earlier on, and uh, I'll step out of the way. This is it right here. Trying to get around has been difficult. Uh, this was uh, as things just got, you can see, this is coming so uh, south, and that, you, that, there's that bridge. This, so this is all north coming this way, and this person is traveling south. Uh, towards Escondido, and they're coming away from Escondido, uh, and then all the way down there, and it's just backed up for hours and hours and hours before uh, it really starts to clear. Let me show you some of the clearing on some of the roadways right now. Uh, this is uh, into the uh, near the Fallbrook area, and of course, uh, on my photographs, uh, this is look at all the tail lights here, but we now are sh starting to show some clearing. Take a look at this where this uh, plane was just a, a little while ago uh, uh, on the photographs that I have. And this is another photograph here. And you can see all the way here, it's just, you know, to try imagine being stuck in that. And we've all been stuck in some traffic, but this was pretty intense. Now we're starting to get some clearing. We'll change the photograph back to weather one. Here we go. And there's the plane. And this is the live picture here. 
and we're starting to finally get the clearing as they've moved the plane off of the freeway area, allowing traffic to finally flow again. Wonderful Will doing a wonderful job up there. You guys will have more on weather. Weather was not a problem uh, today. It was just beautiful weather. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. Back to you. All right, thank you, Dave. Joining us to talk about today's crash is a former FAA accident investigator who is an aviation lawyer right here in San Diego. Robert Griscom has more than 40 years experience and 25,000 flight hours as a professional pilot. Sir, thank you so much for joining us this evening and sharing your expertise. We appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate you calling me. First of all, the investigators now have been on the scene for s several hours. What is the first thing that they're doing and then what will they do once that plane has moved? Generally, the first thing you do is you document the scene. You may document it photographically or by taking notes and drawing sketches, whatnot. You doc document the scene first, and you then move in closer to get a look at the wreckage itself. I, looking at the news photographs of the airplane, I haven't seen the airplane itself, but looking at the news photographs, I noticed two things that give me a clue. One is that the landing gear appears to be partially deployed as though it collapsed upon landing. And the other is that the flaps are deployed. And that tells me that the pilot was actually trying to land. I suspect that the only reason he would land on a freeway is if he had some sort of emergency, which would most likely be a power plant. He, he most likely lost power. That's just a guess. Sure. The investigators would be looking into those. They would investigate the condition of the propeller and that sort of thing to see whether the engine was developing power. Uh, this particular type of airplane is a very sophisticated, complex airplane. I don't believe that an amateur would even try to undertake building it himself. Yeah, let's talk about that for a moment. So Lance Air 4, it says it is a home-built prop jet aircraft, but home-built doesn't mean, necessarily mean the owner takes it home in a kit and puts it together. No, it does not. Uh, the Lance Air 4, is a, it, it, the, the structure is composite. It's fiberglass and carbon fibers. They're very strong, mm -hmm. and it's very clean. It's a very fast airplane. Uh, but it is complex. It's got a, a 350 horsepower six cylinder engine that'll take it up to 28,000 feet. It's not your typical family yeah. vacation airplane. Uh, the composites, the way it is built, require some expertise in order to put it together properly. And if it was built in 2000 and it has flown before and it's been flying, then it must have been put together properly to go through all the inspections that are necessary every 100 hours. So I would suppose that as most Lancers are, this aircraft was built by a professional mechanic mm -hmm. who supervised the owner who helped, put it, helped the mechanic put it together. That way they, they, they can register it as an experimental aircraft as a home built because the, the owner did have some hand in building it. But he was under the direct supervision of a, of a mechanic. I, can, I would bet on it. Are these smaller planes riskier to fly in? You know the big commercial jets, we've all heard they have multiple engines. When something goes wrong, how do they troubleshoot in these small planes? Well, in most small airplanes with only one engine, their performance is such it's slower, you know. Mm -hmm. And their performance is such that they can land almost anywhere. It's almost anywhere, not anywhere. Yeah. And the engines are very dependable. They don't fail very often. If they do fail, about nine times out of 10, it's because there's a problem with the fuel. Either not enough fuel, they ran out, or mismanagement, switching from one tank to another. Airplanes have crashed with 30 gallons of fuel still on board. And I want to ask you real quick, witnesses have said that they saw fuel leaking as the plane was coming in. Any connection, potentially? Well, I don't know that yeah. they could see the fuel leaking as it was coming in. Once it struck the ground, then it's understandable. Obviously, yeah. 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 But I, uh, yeah. they might have seen some fluid escaping. Not necessarily fuel. 
So not necessarily. So sure. quickly, now that they have the plane in their possession, they're moving it somewhere else, what, what will happen there? They will examine the engine mm -hmm. to see if the engine did fail. If there was a problem with the engine, they will examine the fuel system to see if there is any fuel or if there was an imbalance of fuel. Fuel in one tank, but no fuel in the other tank, and the wrong tank was selected. That's mismanagement. Yeah. They will get into many more things that we don't have time to talk about. <laughs> Those are, are what, what, what I would concentrate my initial efforts on to determine whether there was fuel or if the engine failed for some other reason. All right. uh, but I would be, I would be willing to, to bet, without having seen the aircraft or the wreckage or anything, I'd be willing to bet that for one reason or another, the engine failed and the pilot was deliberately trying to land on that freeway. And that's a pretty educated guess coming from a man that's had 40 years of experience. Thank you so much, Mr. Grissom. We appreciate it. You're quite welcome. Well, while today's plane crash is definitely out of the ordinary, this isn't the first time a plane has made an emergency landing on a San Diego freeway. But as we are about to show you, today was the first time in recent memory somebody died. A plane suddenly appearing right in the middle of the freeway. While it certainly is surprising to anyone who witnesses it, it's not unheard of. In fact, KUSI has found at least five other instances where something similar has happened in just the last four years. Let's begin in 2012. A plane makes an emergency landing on Highway 67 in Santee due to engine problems. Fortunately, a CHP officer sees the plane in trouble and is able to stop traffic. At that time, the pilot had no choice. He made a hard uh, left turn because the only safe place he could put the plane down was on the freeway. Fortunately, this officer was in a perfect position to be able to observe what was going on and to stop the freeway with the traffic brake so that he could do so. That same weekend, a small plane carrying four people is forced to make an emergency landing right on the 15 in Escondido. Because it was pretty late at night, the plane is able to avoid the small amount of traffic. In 2013, another two close calls. First, in Otay Mesa, a single-engine Cessna lands in the northbound lanes on State Route 125 after losing power. It was an incident where I had carburetor icing. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, the engine cut out, I couldn't get the engine to restart. It started, it sputtered, it came on, it came off, and it wouldn't continue. And I couldn't make it to the airport, so I decided to land on the highway. A couple of months later, another one in Santee. A small plane lands right on State Route 52 due to engine trouble. Fortunately, the pilot somehow finds a break in traffic and no one is hurt. And just last year, some South Bay drivers get a surprise when a vintage plane touches down briefly on the 125 southbound at H Street between cars in some light traffic. With a sudden burst of power, the pilot takes off again, only to crash in the Otay Ranch section of Chula Vista. Uh, he was a little shooken up initially from the adrenaline, and uh, now that the reality of it's setting in, he's uh, very thankful it uh, ended up the way it did. Again, in all these previous instances, no one was seriously injured. But why so many emergency landings in San Diego? Well, it's anybody's guess, but there are 11 different airports throughout our county. We will continue to bring you the latest on this developing story as it becomes available on air and online. We have posted the story to our homepage with the latest details, along with pictures and video that all of you have sent us. Just head to our website, KUSI.com. Well, candidates are stepping up their campaigns days before the Wisconsin primary. Coming up on the KUSI News of Six, what the candidates are doing to keep up the momentum. And the Padres Fan Fest has begun. We'll show you all of the highlights coming up. We'll be right back.